joined now by another candidate in that race, uh, Lisa Nandy. She joins us now. Thank you very much for coming uh, to see us uh, in, in the studio in London. Much appreciated. Very much. Um, I just want to start with Iran. Uh, it's, a, it's such a, a, a concern to so many of our viewers, the yeah. escalating tensions, uh, Donald Trump uh, coming out over the weekend saying that he uh, could potentially be targeting Iranian sites if they uh, respond. Now we've just hit, hit, saw the tweet for Iran's foreign minister saying that that would be effectively a war crime. Yeah. What's your view on what's happening? Um, so I think this is a really, really dangerous moment for the entire world um, and for Britain in particular. What we need to see is a prime minister who, uh, to be honest, should have already recalled parliament in order to explain what his strategy is, how he's going to work with our European allies to try and de-escalate the situation. Um, the, there's no question that Soleimani is a dangerous individual who's done some terrible, terrible things, including putting down those pro-democracy protests in Iran. But actually, one of the, the things that's happened since uh, Trump took this reckless uh, unilateral action a few days ago is that we've seen those pro-democracy movements um, falling apart, that people getting behind the Iranian regime. I think we potentially have uh, a really, really dangerous and permanent situation that could escalate into all-out war unless the world leaders step up and speak with one voice and try to make sure that we take um, a multilateral approach to try and calm this situation. I mean, you criticise um, Boris Johnson for not recalling Parliament, but really, what can we actually do? Well, I mean, the Americans acted without warning us. Clearly, the UK government doesn't want to take the side of the Iranians. What but, can we do? Well, I think that's a sign, actually, of how little influence we now have in the world. We've had a decade of a Tory government that has been smashing up our relationships with our closest allies. And one of the things that Brexit has done that has been really, really damaging to the UK is that in the path that Boris Johnson has pursued, it's left us begging the US for a trade deal and unable to, to stand up and speak when we need to be heard and we need to be counted. And I think what we need to hear from the Prime Minister is that he's prepared to do that and that he's prepared to work with our European allies to make that happen. I mean, there is, there is a model for this and there is a precedent for this. If you cast your mind back a few years ago, Barack Obama managed to lead the world in negotiating a deal that helped to make sure that... Iran was not a nuclear threat to the rest of the world. And that came about because of years of diplomacy, painstaking diplomacy behind the scenes, and world leaders working together in order to restrain what was quite a dangerous situation. And of course, Donald Trump came in and, and smashed that to pieces by, by pulling out unilaterally, but also had the sort of tacit okay. support from the UK. And okay. we need to hear from the Prime Minister that things are going to be very different. Um I'm keen to talk about your pitch for the Labour leadership and um, yep. what you've come on the programme, of course, to talk about. Um, I asked Emily Thorne with the same question. She didn't quite say yes. Do you think that Jeremy Corbyn was a good leader of the Labour Party? Um, I think he did something profoundly important for us. And I want to say this because it really matters to me. And I think we're in danger of learning the wrong lessons from what has just happened. If you cast your mind back to 2015, we were knocking on people's doors in an election, saying to people who were seeing the social fabric falling apart, who'd had five years of austerity, who were really, really deeply worried about the crumbling infrastructure and the chances okay. for their children. And we were saying to people, we'll give you three quid off your energy bill and we'll give you 12 quid off your childcare. And it just didn't cut it. People were looking for deeper a much more fundamental change. And at the same time, we were saying to people, if you give us permission to, to govern, what we'll do is we'll make sure that we, you know, we don't let immigrants into this country, that we're not, you know, we don't raise benefits too much, that we're not paying people a living wage. All of those things actually were really problematic for the Labour Party because we are a party that has to have the courage of our convictions and wear our values on our sleeves. So why did you just have your worst election defeat since the 1930s? Trust. Trust was the issue, not the radicalism, not the deep and fundamental change that we were promising, but trust. We simply, it says in our constitution, Labour seeks the trust of the people to govern and people didn't trust us. One of the things I really felt during the election was that when the Tories said get Brexit done, um, the more that we talked about what was happening in the NHS, the crisis in the NHS, rough sleeping, mental health, the, uh, the, the chaos on the railways, which I know you're going to talk about in a moment, the, the, the falling apart of the bus network, every time we talked about 
those things, people turned around to us and said, we agree with you, but then in order to deal with that, you've got to get Brexit done. And it gave a potency to the Tory message the trust that we just hadn't understood. You say that the radicalism appealed, but you won't trust it. But those things are linked, aren't they? Who wouldn't trust it because they mm. thought it was too radical, that it was basically pie in the sky? I'm, I'm not sure that they thought it was too radical. Certainly when we were talking to people, for example, about renationalising the railways, people felt it was a no-brainer. They couldn't okay. believe that we hadn't been talking about it before. But what they really didn't trust us to do was to get our priorities right. When we said that we would offer free broadband, I remember somebody in Lee saying to me, I just want a functioning bus network. On um, Brexit, clearly a big issue, something that you've um, spoken about as well. Um, of course, Labour piled up votes in some of these metropolitan areas, but lost heavily in Leave voting towns in particular, somewhere that I know you represent. Do you think that some of your colleagues in the Labour Party, potentially in the Shadow Cabinet, just didn't get it, just didn't understand what people were saying on doors in places like Wigan? I think there is definitely a disconnect between the hierarchy of the Labour Party and um, the country and people in towns like mine who were took when Brexit happened, we immediately went straight to a discussion about free movement, single markets, customs unions, all of which are very, very important to people right across the country, including in Wigan. But what we hadn't understood was that take back control resonated like no other slogan in my lifetime. Why did it resonate? Because people lack the means to affect change in their own lives. And Labour has, in recent years, has become a very paternalistic party. We commission think tanks to write us reports in central London. We sit behind desks in Westminster or in Victoria Street, commissioning opinion polls and focus groups. And then we go out and we tell people that we're going to fix it. Do you but think actually, people perhaps look down on some voters in your well, area then? Well, I think that is a, a way, I think that is a way of patronising people because actually we've always been a movement that was built by and for working people for working people to affect change in their own lives and to change the circumstances of their own lives. The trains are a really good example of that. If you'd asked people in the north of England what, what, what they wanted money spent on in terms of transport, they would have started with buses. And we just simply haven't got it. There was a moment when Jeremy Corbyn stood up at Prime Minister's Questions a few years ago and talked about buses. And I remember this roar of noise coming from the commentariat in London telling us that it was ridiculous that the want-to-be Prime Minister was standing at the dispatch box talking about buses. I tell you, I got on a train and went home and people were saying, thank God. God, someone's talking about our buses okay. for a change. Um, I wonder um, how your message will go down with the Labour members, of course, who are the people that you need if you're going to have a chance uh, of winning the leadership. A poll uh, by YouGov um, this week of Labour members. This is a percentage of first preferences. I mean, you're bottom there at 5%. Is that a bit disappointing? Um, no, because it's a name recognition poll. And I think that Emily said before that um, what it doesn't do either is tell you how many people don't know and haven't made up their minds. And actually, people who haven't made up their minds are the majority in the Labour Party. You've got a long way to go, though, haven't you? Of course, and, and, and it's, but it's right that Labour members get to make their own minds up. And what I think this is actually quite profoundly disrespectful to try and bounce people into thinking that there's only one candidate and one candidate can win. Because our members... You know, I was a councillor in London before I... Before I, before I got elected to Parliament. I lived in London for eight years, working for um, Centrepoint and then the Children's Society with Child Refugees. And I spent a lot of time um, with members. Our typical member now lives in London, uh, cares deeply about poverty, cares deeply about winning elections because they want to affect real change in their own communities and across the country. And I know that they care as much about winning in Wigan as they do in Walthamstow and they want to have this debate and they want to have this conversation and they want to get it okay. right. OK. Um, do you have the number of MPs you need to get on the ballot? Um, so it's, it's looking very positive, but I wouldn't in any sense be complacent about that. So not quite yet, then, I've, maybe? Well, I've, I've, got to, I've, got to go, I've got to make the case, and I, I, think, I think we should, should be OK, but I don't want to be complacent. You know, my colleagues, um, especially those who were elected when I was a decade ago, we've been through three leadership contests in the last decade, and rightly, we're all trying to think very hard about getting this right. It's one of 
the reasons, to be honest, why I did spend a few weeks after the election just trying to work okay. out whether I was the right person to do this and whether I should put myself forward, and why I went to Ashfield to listen to the voters that we'd lost. Take it on the chin, it was quite hard, to be honest, and it was quite heartbreaking and quite emotional to listen to. But when people said we need a different sort of leadership and a different sort of leader, um, I thought that now is the time to step up, and that's the case that I'm making to my colleagues. OK, Lisa Nandy, thank you very Thanks. much for coming on the programme, setting out your pitch uh, for the Labour Party leadership. Appreciate it.